Awesome. Looks like we got some, some people hopping on. Thanks everybody for joining. We'll get started in just a moment. All right, I think we're just about at the one o'clock time. So welcome and thank you everybody for joining ThreadX's Snack Attack webinar today, focused on building security into your APIs. My name is Cindy Cafaro and I'm a product manager here at ThreadX. And partnering with me today is Tom Hickman, our own chief product officer, along with members from the ThreadX SOC, Neil Weisel and Alex Gatz. Not only is also time to hear about trends being seen from the ThreadX front lines, share insights about what we're learning and similar challenges organizations face, but it's also time to put a few friendly faces to our organization. So the ThreadX team will be taking questions after the presentation. Please, throughout our conversation, feel free to post those in the Q&A Slack and we'll make sure to return back to it. Um, but until then, we certainly have an action-packed agenda, so we'll go ahead and we'll hop on into things. So for today's webinar, we'll be starting the conversation with Tom Hickman, who's been leading engineering organizations for decades now, to walk us through the happy path of how to design and develop your web applications. Next, we'll hand things over to Neil and Alex to explain maybe the not so happy path of how attackers are going to try to reverse engineer and actually break your web apps and APIs. And finally, we'll round out our session today with Tom and Alex and Neil working together to answer some questions around how teams can develop attack ready APIs. So with that, we'll hop on in. Great. Um, so, oh. Yeah, so, so hey everyone, uh, welcome and thanks for spending uh, your lunch hour or, or a mid-morning snack with us, depending on where you are on the planet right now. Uh, as Sydney said, I've been leading engineering and product delivery in venture-backed startups since the mid-90s. So I've spanned three decades, I've spent a lot of development of tech stacks, of internet commerce, of general sort of network connectivity across the planet. And um, I've learned a lot, mostly the school of hard knocks by making mistakes. So a little bit of what I say comes from getting beaten up and bruised up uh, through the years. Um, we're gonna get into um, APIs generally as, as a design pattern, why and where, when and how. And then um, importantly, talk about building them to sort of survive the real world today. So. To start APIs, there's nothing really special about APIs, right? I think that the, the first thing and probably the best thing we can do for you if you're just starting your API security journey is to demystify APIs in general. There's, um, they are for sure the building blocks of modern web application, but there's nothing really you know, unique or, or wonderful or specific or magical about them. There's multiple tech stacks, multiple standards, but all APIs are basically, the way I think of them is fancy remote procedure calls or fancy remote function calls. There is some piece of software sitting somewhere on an internet worked computer, sitting there waiting to be asked to do math to something. That math might be a database lookup that puts um, information back out on the wire. That math might be literal math, adding two to some other function and returning the sum. But that's all APIs are. If you think of them that way, it makes the process of sort of what to do next a little bit simpler to understand. So all API development, all web app development begins with a dream, right? Some product manager somewhere writes a user story that says user X wants to do job Y to achieve business values. And if you're an engineer or you're a leading engineer, you're gonna take that dream and you're gonna turn it into functioning shipping and production code. Some of that code is going to be front end, there's going to be a DMARC, some of it's going to be back end. There may be API calls that your private um, clients use, there may be public API calls that you expose to your user community. 
And the biggest dream that's driven the development of APIs over the last sort of five to 10 years in my career has been the DevOps revolution and the second DevOps revolution that followed, right? And you can sum that dream up by saying, automate all the things, right? Um, machine to machine communication in an internet works system of porous corporate boundaries means that, you know, I go out to GitHub for, for my pull requests and I go to Atlassian Cloud to look up my JIRA tickets and I go to Slack um, and their hosting environment for a lot of my comms and I go to Office 365. All of those porous SaaS tools and, and that entire tool chain are interconnected many times by and through the ages of um, APIs. So that's great, um, builds a wonderful world. But what I have also learned um, through firsthand experience, um, won't name names uh, to protect the, the innocent and the guilty, but um, when you increase your functional footprint in an application, you also increase your attack surface. And APIs, because they're, they're used programmatically by software robots, uh, they can be used by software robots to um, do bad things as well as their intended design. So with that ever increasing functional footprint and ever increasing attack surface, um, security becomes paramount, right? Uh, the, the other thing I've learned as a vendor, uh, but both as a vendor and as a practitioner is that you can't really, really test security into software, just like you can't test scalability and you've got to design it from the ground up to be secure. And um, one of the things that, as we were prepping this talk, um, the combination of sort of builders and, and red teamers that we have here in this company, um, we believe that expecting the unexpected is the right mindset to have. And um, with that, I'll hand it off to Neil and Alex. Um, Neil and Alex are from our security operations center and they spend all day, every day kind of on the wall um, observing um, attacks against APIs and protecting them. So guys, uh, tell us a little bit about what you see in that security first mindset and what you're seeing in the, um, you know, in the wild. Well, in the regards to the security first mindset, I think it's something that in general, we're all trying to go through that maturation process right now. Um, and I think that we're all at varying degrees of that because, you know, as you were kind of talking through some of the hardening techniques through the development side, you know, as you know, security practitioners, you know, we're, we're very aware of that hardening techniques and where some of those pitfalls, you know, uh, kind of are on that, uh, that path, that happy path, so to speak. Um, and so we are kind of aware of those and we try to identify those and exploit them. So, you know, things like session management and things uh, that maybe approaches to encryption uh, maybe aren't always done uh, to, the, to the most uh, hardened techniques. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, like we, we like to ensure our customers are um, not leaving like old versions open for their endpoints and we kind of help them through that and just make sure that we're minimizing that potential attack footprint every day. So to get a temperature check of everybody who's joined us virtually in the room, I'll go ahead and, and launch a poll and we can start to get a good check from everybody to see, you know, what are you doing to protect your APIs now? You know, how is your organization adapted to certain technologies and, you know, what's working for you? Um, I realize you might not be able to get all the detail that I just kind of talked through in your poll response, but we'll we'll be sending out a few more throughout this conversation as well too. So we'll give everybody just a moment. Looks like we still have some answers coming in. So one thing that I'll I'll chime in about is even in the poll, you can see that there is no single. Um, silver bullet for API security, just as there's no single silver bullet for web security or for application security in general. Each of these solutions in the space, um, you know, can be treated as, you know, almost as mythical as, as APIs themselves. But at the end of the day, each approach is um, one tool, one tool in your tool chain that can help you publish, manage, develop, test, deliver, um, functional APIs as well as secure APIs. So, and it looks like a lot of folks using API Gateway 
yeah. some managed service and some API management platforms, um, yeah. which, which is not, not surprising. Everybody, probably everybody has a little bit of SAS and DAS in their world, um, you know, pre-production. So that's good. Um, you're on the right, you know, you're on the right steps with that security first mindset that we recommend, if you can even answer that question. Right. And it always comes in layers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, what I'll do here is, Neil, I'm curious to turn it over to yourself and Alex to start to maybe help us explain and, and understand what are the common attack techniques hackers use when they are trying to exploit your APIs. Can you talk us through a little bit more around that, you know, security first hacker mindset? Sure. Um, I mean, it's very difficult to, uh, I mean, you know, as Tom is talking about, you know, there's a lot of interoperability and in automating all the things right now. And, you know, you're talking about, maybe we're going to Atlassian to see, you know, our feature requests and things of that nature. And those are integrating with, you know, other tools that we're using. And what's nice from an attacker perspective, but also nice from a developer perspective is a lot of that is documented. And so we're able to see a lot of that documentation and say, okay, well, if this is what that machine is expecting, um, perhaps they're not going to expect this uh, per se. Um, maybe they're not going to expect specialized characters in particular you know, key value pairs. Um, so you know, that, that's kind of one of the areas that we start um, one of the ones that Alex touched on earlier is, you know, the depreciation of old APIs. So like a lot of times when we're looking at that documentation, um, we'll go ahead and say, all right, hey, uh, what was in their, you know, previous release? Um, maybe they had a delete method. Maybe there was, you know, another value pair that we liked to use. Is that still available even though it's not documented? Um, can we, you know, leverage that um, maybe... Uh, with that, there's some different authentication or authorization mechanisms that are kind of around that. Um, so using some of those techniques, understanding what some of the common naming conventions are, doing some of the normal fuzzing things that you do uh, with attacking your web applications or APIs in general, it's kind of where we start. Um, but again, it's like always starting with profiling, understanding uh, what you uh, have access to and kind of like how you might exploit it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I missed something there. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a very open-ended question, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I kind of like to think about it from like um, start to finish with um, starting to look for any kind of open source intelligence you can gather, any kind of information you can gather about a target as an attacker. So from the customer perspective, anything you're leaving open in the clear that you wouldn't necessarily want someone to see, maybe some old developer notes, maybe, um, a stack overflow post that one of your engineers made that you didn't realize. And, and within that, there could contain some paths to um, endpoints that shouldn't be exposed to the public that now someone has access to. Along with that, there's lots of tools around trying to identify what kind of tech stacks you have. So things like Wappalizer, for example, or um, I mean, there's, there's endless tools that can kind of give the attacker an idea of maybe what kind of database you're using and they'll utilize that information and try something like SQL injection in a field that normally wouldn't accept that. And that's that's um, the fun part for an attacker and that's the part that we're trying to uh, protect people against. As, as we were prepping for this talk, listening to Neil and Alex give this talk, this you know these points you just heard, what struck me is that attackers are really kind of modern day cartographers, right? Yeah. They're, not, they're not necessarily <laughs> sailing the coastline of New England and drawing maps, but they're talking to people who have, and they're gathering all that information and they're getting contradictory claims and accurate claims. And then they're, they're drawing a map, but guess what? That map is your app. And the reason they're, they're drawing that map isn't to explore it, it's to exfiltrate data from it and to steal. You know, We're I, making a treasure map. It's a, it's, that's a great, great metaphor. You're making a treasure map. You just don't want the X to be like, you know, on your server. Yeah. Awesome team. So we've talked about, you know, how attackers will do the background searching to create kind of like that treasure map to figure out, you know, where is that X that marks the spot. If you had to maybe list like the top three most common techniques hackers use, what would what would they be? And you can you kind of explain a little bit more about how hackers use those in the larger scheme of sophisticated attacks we might see? I mean, you ideally want to start with some sort of way of like promiscuously listening or seeing 
what you know things are already being sent to an API endpoint. Because with that type of profile information, you already have like a known good. And you can usually see what things, uh, you can either re replay it and see what things the API endpoint is giving you back. Um, so so that's, that's the ideal scenario. Um, but that's not always, you know, available if you can't like sit next to the API endpoint, kind of promiscuously listen to uh, what's being sent and what it's responding. So you kind of have to be on like the same network to do some of those types of things. So that's where, you know, we, we kind of like lean heavily on documentation. Or um, if we have access to like the web application that's actually interacting with that API endpoint. Um, those are definitely like the, the first few like reconnaissance techniques that come to my mind. Um, and then I don't know, I'm sure Alex is going to touch a little bit there on kind of the attacks that we would, you know, push toward those. Sure, yeah. Um, just to kind of, in addition to what Neil was saying, you know, tools that you might use are like Burp Suite, Zap. There's lots of fun tools out there you can play with and kind of see the interactions between a web application and an API. Uh, the tools act as like a man in the middle between your web application. They're, they're essentially a proxy. This traffic passes through, shows up on the screen. You can make edits. You can... Um, make changes and push that you can repeat dip certain requests it makes it really convenient for attackers to uh, kind of profile your api and start kind of documenting and um, collecting information just like what that normal traffic looks like uh, with that um, maybe they would start using like a fuzzing tool so like maybe you see some endpoint that's interesting and they're they're going to try like really weird stuff maybe you think your endpoint only accepts strings and they're going to try integers, they're going to try Booleans, they're going to try all kinds of different types. And maybe maybe your endpoint does accept strings, but it only accepts 20 characters, or you hope it only accepts 20 characters, and they try 200 characters. They're going to, attackers are very creative. You know, they come up with very unique things that maybe your engineers just simply didn't think of. And that's, that's kind of why you need those layers of protection is to cover for those cases. Yeah, definitely some of the areas that I like to kind of poke at when I'm doing kind of like the security testing of things is uh, what things do I have access to do? Uh, maybe you only wrote this API thinking that the machine would interact with it. And so it's only going to glean information, but perhaps I can also, you know, edit the information or delete the information or make it appear differently um, under certain circumstances. You know, and that kind of comes into the layers because some of that's gonna be application levels and that's gonna be infrastructural level. So kind of you know, playing in the hand of both all things kind of working uh, together to create that you know, really hardened picture. Uh, there's a lot of room for error and that's kind of like the thing that we always have to keep in mind when we're protecting these endpoints is you know, as a, you know, the defenders, we have to be right all the time but the attackers only have to be right once. So it, we really do try to enumerate all of these potential areas and you know, make sure we have the strongest defense. Awesome. Thanks so much for answering that in such detail, Neil and Alex. I, I, I greatly appreciate it. Um, so I guess, Tom, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to help us back into uh, the engineer side of the house, which is, you know, what should we do in response to these attacks that uh, were just explained. Sure. Um, so it starts at the beginning, um, and it starts with collaboration, right? And we, you've heard you've heard us say in, in you know three different um, three different phrases: security and depth, right? We all believe in multiple layers of security. Um, one of those is um, literally having people like. Neil and Alex in the room with developers while they're designing software and working hand in hand with them to say, oh, you're going to do that? You know that if you do that, I'm going to come in as an attacker and, and do this exploit. And honestly and sadly, that stuff's not taught in CS programs as well as it should be. Um, I, I was 15 years into the business before I, I was privy to what a white hat hacker can do to a system if left unattended for 30 minutes, right? And I was, <laughs> I, I remember walking away going like, wow, I have been so lucky for so long in these other companies. So having that security professional in the room during design, during, you know, like even during, um, you know, sprint grooming where you're talking about an approach to a problem 
is going to make the development team more security aware. Um, that's uh, there's a two, that's also a two sided um, sword, right? Because you as a security team, if you're the CISO organization, you'll understand what the developers are about to start building, and you'll be able to say. Oh no, you're not putting that there. That's got to be behind the DMARC. That's got to be in a hardened system. You're not going to put a local database on client side for, for something, you know, whatever the, the silly things were. Um, and then, you know, as you move into production, there, there's other sort of, uh, you know, collaborative points between security and app owners. Uh, it doesn't have to be an adversarial relationship. Um, the security team understands attacks and can understand error codes and, and has generally usually tooling to sort of throw alerts um, in production, much like a DevOps shop would have alerts for like spikes in memory. Um, a good security practice will have alerts for like spikes in attacks. I mean, you guys see that all day, every day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, and it's a hundred percent. The point is if you have security with like their own seat at the table, and they can sit right next to these individuals that are going to be working on these features. It, it gives them both understanding of like each other's perspective. You end up with a much better product. Yeah, and, and even you know some of the the recommendations on the right um, wouldn't occur to me, right, naively that I should be you know obfuscatory in picking the names of my endpoints. <laughs> right. But you know uh, slash v1 slash login <laughs> might not be the best idea, right guys? Yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. It makes it very easy to uh, just guess at any endpoint, really. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. the more you can obfuscate that, the better. Yeah. Perfect. So, you know, security and engineers working hand in hand can meet in a lot of different things as far as evolving your strategies when developing your APIs but also secondarily having the understanding to recognize what is suspicious, what is anomalous in the activity side of things. Do we have an engineer working on a new version of an API or do we actually have a, a hacker scanning? Being able to differentiate those, those activity pieces comes with working hand in hand and communicating openly between organizations. Um, now this is just, uh, this is something that we are reiterating over and over again, but I'm curious again to get feedback from, from teams that have joined us today. So I'll go ahead and launch our second poll, which we're curious to understand, you know, what's your biggest challenges when trying to plan for, implement, evolve your API protection capabilities or, or approaches in your security organization? Um, we'll leave this up for, uh, a minute or so, we'll wait for about at least 50% response before I'll go ahead and end it and share out the results. Great, I'll, I'll say while we're waiting for people to, uh, to weigh in, um, the way I read that last bullet, um, the biggest challenge is human resources. Um, cynically, I, I think of that as layer eight, right? Yeah. But it's not. It's not so much the resources part of it as the human, right? That that it's always like weakest link is is uh, you know a person with a post-it note with a password written on it. Right? <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> that unfortunately, yeah, yeah, unfortunately yeah. but true. I, I'm gonna guess that it's gonna be like the schema and or documentation. It, that's a really interesting one. Um, you know, different tech stacks have, of course, different methodologies for that um, specification and documentation. And the, and I know this from, from, you know, again, being a vendor in the space for a long time and having been in MNCs where we had 3,000 apps in our portfolio, yeah. it's, it's also the mix of first party and second slash third, third party. party yeah. And um, things that are, you know, at, under active development as tier one APIs probably have like a really nice OAS through schema, but that stuff that was developed using, you know, SOAP uh, design patterns seven years ago, that's still out there running the exactly. payroll reconciliation we, process. That's still month. running out there? Exactly. Like, oh my God. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. On some NT4 server tucked in the yeah. corner of some dusty data center. Under somebody's so, desk. Oh, yeah. Geez. So let's see, let's see what people say. APIs in real time. Yeah. Budget, bot attacks, DDoS for sure, FPs, yeah. The, um, 
the FP thing, you know, that the, we were talking about uh, just a minute ago, developers doing things like, you know, is it some developer working on yeah. and running some some tests against prod that, that maybe she shouldn't be doing in prod? That that I think is one of the, the common um, FP complaints yeah. that, well, we, yeah. that we get for sure. Yeah. So, nice. Nice. So, so for all of y'all who replied, your, your worlds are not vastly unlike ours. Right? <laughs> yeah. So. And that's us as, as practitioners. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, I guess to, to help us round out the session and come to a, a high level conclusion, I'll hand it off to, to Neil. Can you talk us through a little bit more the final thoughts of how attackers are going to specifically target your APIs, coincidentally enough, since that was the top <laughs> response? No, no problem. Yeah, I mean, it, it really boils down to that it's not an if they're going to uh, like target your APIs or your applications, but of when, like time-wise, when that's going to happen, right? They will target, you know, anything on layer seven web application APIs that HTTP protocol. It's going to happen, and you know, what can we do uh, to prevent these, you know, you know, API enumeration attacks, API fuzzing, um, all of these things that people are going to be doing to learning about your environment will come together and some form of an attack, uh, whether it be large scale or, you know, slow, low and slow. And so the more we know about what we have and uh, what we're trying to protect, we'll be able to you know, really uh, thwart those attacks, you know, on the onset. Yeah. And then from the engineering perspective, sort of down in the, the SDLC, the biggest advice I can give to anyone in, in my shoes running a product organization is collaborate, 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 build a constructive relationship with your CISO and, and with the security analysts and practitioners. They will change the way your team thinks. They will help you understand the mandate to code defensively. And by virtue of that, you'll build better software um, in your greenfield deployments. Doesn't do a lot for you for that stuff we talked about that, that some other team in your organization that are now long retired did seven or eight or 10 years ago. But um, you know, it, it positions you to do no harm. So, yeah. Alex, what about the, uh, the sort of design and, and, and development and attack methods? Would you you know, let's let's say hypothetically, you're in my grooming session later this afternoon, and we're talking <laughs> about some backlog that we're pulling in. What what would you get from mind for a developer? Uh, yeah, so um, definitely start obfuscating your endpoint names because there are endless lists out there that already exist and tools that will very quickly enumerate those on their own, and then the attacker already has all the information they need to start poking around at the next level there. Um, Ensuring input sterilization. Mm -hmm. I think that one's huge, actually. I mean, just every single input you have, every every key value pair in your API needs to have sterile input. I mean, you need to make sure that nothing else except except exactly what you're expecting to go in there can go. Some expectation on every source and sink. Yeah. Yeah. Um, little, probably little Johnny drop tables in there. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's those are two big ones that come right to mind. Um, a third one, maybe just keeping track of any kind of um, test versions of your API that exist out there. Like maybe you had a developer that had to test some edge case that you guys forgot about in your um, planning sessions, and that just got left there on accident. I mean, it happens, right? And then. That's that's a prime target for an attacker. As as your versions progress, maybe you patch that CDE, but that old dev endpoint probably never got touched and it's just hanging out, ready to be exploited. Yeah, it's great points. Great points. I would say the one honorable mention would be you know role based access controls or oh, okay. privilege access model. That's a that's a huge one too. Yeah, I absolutely. mean it, just because we have these expectations of how machines are going to talk to machines uh, with APIs. If if we have those types of assumptions, a lot of times we don't consider that someone's going to you know color outside the lines. Sure, sure. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about holes lately too. With yeah. the broken broken access. So like if um, maybe you did authenticate into one of your endpoints, but it jumps to another one, you don't need to authenticate. You can get you know pull information from that 
endpoint that's not requiring any type of authentication. That seems to come up quite a bit lately. Yeah, there, there's so probably everyone on the the everyone listening in is at least partially familiar with zero trust networking. There's um, you know that it, it's tough if you're um, if your storefront is on the internet, right? You cannot air gap your storefront. You've got to let you know, clients in. You've got to let them interact with your app. But a practical zero trust says, you know, trust no one. Do not trust this machine to machine um, uh, communication, right? Mm -hmm. So, so piling on what Alex is saying here is, um, yeah, just uh, if you can implement a practical zero trust posture and sort of start skeptical. Um, and again, I think this is where having security in the room during design really helps. If you start skeptical, you won't make those, those kind of naive design decisions that end up kind of leaving big holes in your perimeter. Sure. Awesome. Well, Neil, Alex, and, and Tom, certainly appreciate you guys walking through the details of some of the final takeaways. Um, I also want a chance to open it up to the audience, please. Anybody who has any uh, outstanding questions that may have come up during the conversation, feel free to enter them into the QA now. Um, we do have one into the, entered into the QA, so I'll pass it right over to our panelists. Um, at a high level, what are the first few steps you recommend a project lead taking if they were assigned an API security project? And I think Tom, I, I think I saw you raised your hand. Yeah, so, so I, I've actually thought about this quite a lot. Um, the first thing that I do is establish a perimeter of protection. And I say that acknowledging that I've got a horse in that race, y'all. Um, but there's a reason that I'm spending my time here working on this solution because I believe in it. Uh, so whenever I've either inherited an existing deployment, come in to, to lead engineering in an existing uh, startup, first thing to do is, is put a fence around it, right? Yeah. And cleanse input on the way in, you know, with something like uh, a layer seven uh, reverse proxy, you know, to do passive scanning then that buys you time to sort of get your house in order, right? And, and so first step, protect. Second step, get your house in order. That can mean inventorying your assets and your APIs, can mean pen testing and getting, you know, basically a paid gray hat hacker to put the gray away and put the white hat on for a couple of days and, and tell you what um, a real bad guy could do yeah. and then mitigate that stuff, right? Um, obviously scan for vulnerabilities, get a SAS scanning tool, something like um, Sneak, or I used to work at Veracode, so I still like their stuff. Uh, it's some good stuff, but scan your, um, scan your binary, scan your source code, run dynamic tools against it like Burp Suite or, or there's tons of commercial tools, but you'll notice a theme here. Don't do one thing, do many things. Yeah. Start with perimeter and then build your plan and then bring your dev teams along. And um, obviously, you know, stratify and prioritize your assets. Um, PII is critical, um, EPII, so, so um, you know, like, uh, or EPHI, health information, and, and HIPAA compliant stuff, uh, credit card transactions, anything that's moving money is going to be a target. And, um, you know, anything that's a target is gonna make somebody else money and they have a business model designed to um, break your stuff and steal from you. So protect, mitigate, build an in-depth security program. Awesome. Thank you, Tom, for those quick steps to how to be successful in starting your API security journey. Um, I realize we are a few minutes over, so I just wanted to take a shout out and thank everybody for hopping on and joining us today um, for our webinar on building attack-ready APIs. We'll be sure to follow up with your gift card so that everybody can surely enjoy their snack on us. Um, but if you'd like to talk any further about API security, uh, you can certainly reach out to us by engaging with our online resources via the threadx.com website. And we certainly look forward to having everybody uh, in our next webinar. So thank you again for the time today, folks, and hope everybody has a great rest of their day. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate the thanks in the chat.